This is the International Space Station. For over two decades, it has been our home in outer space. But it's a home unlike any other. The ISS is the size of a football field. It orbits the Earth at over 23 times the speed of sound, and with a construction cost of around 160 billion US dollars, the space station is the most expensive structure ever built. And as impressive as all that sounds, it's actually the people that make the ISS exceptional. Human beings from all over the world living together in a place beyond borders, beyond atmosphere, beyond gravity. So let's take a look inside the ISS and see what everyday life is really like 250 miles above Earth. All right, the first thing we need to do is get ourselves strapped into a spacecraft and prepare to blast off. To reach the ISS, you've got two options. Option one, the Russian Soyuz, a compact capsule that's been flying crews to the station since the very beginning. It's a design that's been in use since the late 1960s and has gone mostly unchanged since the era of the Soviet Union. Option two, the SpaceX Crew Dragon, which has a sleek design on the outside, a spacious and comfortable layout on the inside, and is built for the modern era with mostly touchscreen controls. When the hatch finally opens, the crew floats into their new home, and this is where the real experience begins. The ISS isn't the carpeted open concept layout you've seen in a Star Trek TV show. It's more like a floating tunnel system, a series of connected modules, each about the size of a small bus, arranged in a T-shaped layout. The American side includes Destiny, the main science lab, Unity, the central hub, and Tranquility, where the life support and crew quarters live. Europe has the Columbus module, while Japan runs Kaibo, a high-tech lab with its own research facilities. The Russian segment includes Zarya, the very first module ever launched, and Zvezda, the main living quarters and control center. In total, there are more than 15 pressurized modules offering about 13,700 cubic feet of habitable space. That's roughly the size of a six-bedroom house. But don't expect much legroom. Every surface is packed. Laptops, cables, camera gear, lab hardware, air ducts. There's no such thing as wasted space in the ISS. Moving around can be a challenge at first. Without gravity, concepts like up and down don't matter like they do on Earth. Your sense of direction actually comes from fluid sloshing around inside your ears, so once you begin floating in space, that fluid-based system gets scrambled and the brain becomes disoriented. But the crew adapts quickly. Color-coded handrails, clear labels, and lots of practice help astronauts move smoothly and in the right direction. Once we are settled into the station, it's time to think about getting to work. Astronauts don't come here for leisure time. Every hour of every day is strictly scheduled and there is lots to do. But what is a day anyway? The ISS will orbit the Earth once every 90 minutes. That means astronauts experience 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24 hours. This rapid fire day night cycle can seriously mess with a person's internal clock and that's actually very bad for your health. To counter this, the crew follows a standard 24-hour Earth day. The ISS uses special lighting systems that mimic natural sunlight to help maintain their sleep pattern. That's how they avoid a condition known as orbital insomnia that plagued early space explorers. It's also very important to combat boredom in space. Now that might sound trivial, but when people find themselves with nothing to do, we have a tendency to become more impulsive, more irritable, more volatile. And that's not what you want when everyone is confined to one space with no way out. To make sure that no one has enough free time to get weird, astronauts' days are meticulously scheduled down to five-minute chunks. This is all thanks to the operations planning team at Mission Control. There are actually multiple ground control centers for the ISS that are located in America, Russia, Europe, and Japan, so trying to decide what time it is in space can come with its own problems. The international partners settled on Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, meaning that the ISS operates in the same time zone as the United Kingdom. On the space station, your workday begins at 6am and lasts through to 9.30pm. 
Astronauts will typically start their day just like everyone else, getting cleaned up and ready for work, but this is where life begins to get complicated. There is no shower. Without gravity, the water won't go down the drain. It'll go everywhere, and that's not good. Water behaves in a very unusual way once you take gravity away. Water wants to stick together and form into spheres that float around. Water also wants to stick to other things. So if you put water on your face, it'll stick. It won't drip off. If you put water on your toothbrush, it'll stick there as well. So to wash yourself, you basically just put water on a cloth with some soap and do a sort of sponge bath. Not luxurious, but effective. The weirdest part is that you can't spit toothpaste out. It would just go flying in every direction, so you have to swallow it. Getting dressed is easy because you're not allowed to bring your wardrobe into space with you, so most astronauts just wear the same t-shirt every day for about two weeks at a time. Pants typically get worn for a couple of months, and then when the laundry gets too crusty to go on, we don't do a wash, we just throw our clothes in the trash. Now let's talk about the oddly fascinating part of life on the ISS, the toilet. In space, you can't just rely on gravity to pull things down, so the ISS uses suction to do the job. For solid waste, astronauts strap themselves to a small seat, which is really small. Once you are done with that business, suction pulls everything into a plastic-lined container. Then you use a stick to jam your plastic bag of waste down into a storage bucket. These are changed every 10 days, and eventually, they get ejected into space along with all of the other trash, and it just burns up in the Earth's atmosphere. For urine, astronauts use a funnel attached to a vacuum hose designed for both men and women. Suction pulls the liquid into a tank, where it's filtered and recycled into drinking water. On average, 70% of all water on the ISS is recycled it would be impossible to operate in space without a closed water cycle. So yeah, you drink your own pee, and everyone else's pee, but you also breathe it as well. We're getting weird now, but this is fascinating. Oxygen is a precious commodity in space. The ISS has a ventilation system that is constantly filtering the air, removing carbon dioxide, and recirculating it. But eventually, you use up all of the oxygen. To solve this problem, a portion of the recycled water is sent into an electrolysis machine. This uses electricity to split water molecules into their base atoms, hydrogen and oxygen. And then, the oxygen extracted from the recycled pee is added back into the station's air supply. All right, now let's eat. On the ISS, food typically comes in two main varieties. First, there's thermostabilized food, packed in green pouches, basically a space version of military MREs. Second, there's freeze-dried food, with all the moisture removed. Astronauts simply add hot or cold water, rehydrate the meal, and it's ready to eat. But the astronauts can't just eat anything they want. For example, bread is banned, because the crumbs can float around and clog the equipment. The same goes for potato chips. The Simpsons did get that one right. No soda either, because without gravity, carbonation doesn't separate in your stomach and just builds up inside you, leading to something called wet burps, essentially just spontaneous vomiting. On Sunday evenings, everyone on the ISS, Russians, Americans, Europeans, Japanese, we all get together for a ritual pizza party. And you'll need the calories, because every astronaut is required to put in two hours of exercise per day. That's cardio and resistance training. There are treadmills and stationary bikes with straps to hold you down, there are resistance bands to flex your muscles, and there's even this crazy looking piece of gym equipment that uses vacuum pistons to provide a full bodybuilding routine with squats, deadlifts, and bench press, all with up to 600 pounds of resistance. We are doing all this because in space, the body doesn't have to fight against gravity, so muscles weaken and bones lose density over time. This can make you sick while on the station, but it becomes a very serious health problem once you arrive back on Earth. Even with the exercise routine of an athlete, the environment of space can have strange health effects. The most common is the space snuffles. Without gravity, your bodily fluids have a tendency to accumulate in your head, making you very congested. 
Another common health problem that's taken a little more seriously is the effect of space on your vision. We used to think this was caused by the rush of blood to the head, but problems with vision are now being linked to changes in the liquids surrounding the brain and spinal cord that create excess pressure inside the skull. The result is that astronauts become nearsighted, meaning anything in the distance gets blurry. Anyway, with health and hygiene taken care of, it's time we get to work. The ISS is one of the most advanced science labs ever built. Its main mission is to explore science in zero gravity. It's a unique environment where researchers can study how the absence of gravity affects biological, physical, and chemical processes. Things we just can't replicate on Earth. For example, NASA has conducted studies on muscle atrophy and bone density to understand aging and disease on Earth. Astronauts themselves are both scientists and subjects, essentially becoming guinea pigs in the unique human experiment. They are also working on space agriculture, testing how crops like lettuce and mustard greens grow in orbit. Because if we are planning missions to Mars or beyond, astronauts will need to grow their own food. In 2015, ISS crew members harvested and ate the very first space-grown lettuce. But science isn't their only job. Astronauts also handle routine maintenance. They check life support systems, clean air filters, update software, and sometimes even repair the walls of the space station. And when something outside the spacecraft needs fixing, they suit up for a spacewalk, also known as extravehicular activity. But getting ready for a spacewalk is a complicated process. They spend around four hours of prep time checking equipment and making sure everything fits just right. And then the spacewalk itself is typically going to last between five and eight hours. So this is an all day commitment. And yes, the spacesuit does include a diaper. When you finally call it quits for the day, you'll get a chance to relax in your own personal sleeping quarters. You enter through one of four small doorways that are built into the walls of the habitation module. Inside the bunk, you get about as much space as an old phone booth. Every astronaut has their own laptop computer for keeping in touch with the people of Earth, and they'll typically keep personal items and tools in there as well. The only challenge is that everything needs to be attached to the wall with Velcro to stop it from floating around. You even need to secure your own body to the wall by zipping up into a tethered sleeping bag. Unlike your typical camping gear, this bag has armholes that allow your limbs to just float freely. So that marks the end of our day on the space station, and like all good things, the ISS itself has an end date as well. NASA and its partners plan to bring it down around 2030. After over three decades in space, the station will make a controlled descent into Earth's atmosphere, burning up into smaller chunks that will sink to the bottom of the South Pacific Ocean. But although it may seem like the end, it really isn't. In fact, NASA has already shifted its focus to commercial space stations. Companies like Axiom Space and Blue Origin working on private orbital labs. These platforms will carry forward the legacy of the ISS, hosting astronauts, running experiments, and maybe even welcoming tourists.